Welcome to Pivot Points, a new series featuring some of the world's most successful women, candidly sharing their stories and insights about how they made it to the top, and how you can too. Hosted by Perry Yateman, a straight-talking global executive and award-winning author who created the career and life of her dreams, and now wants to help other ambitious women do the same. Welcome, this is Perry Yateman, host of Pivot Points. My next guest is someone who, by her own admission, has had a rather unplanned rise to the top. From academia to healthcare, presidential appointee to corporate, Joan has gone from strength to strength, parlaying each success into her next new and exciting adventure. All the while juggling a dual career marriage and a multi-state commute. Today, she's the head of a multi-billion dollar business unit for TE Connectivity. Her name is Joan Wainwright, and I can't wait for you all to meet her because I just know there is so much she has to share. Welcome, Joan. Thanks, Perry. Good to be with you. It's so good of you to make the time for us. So we know where you are, but let's just go back if we can and talk about how did you get yourself launched? How did you get on this path? And was there a specific role or job that you really feel launched you? And if so, why and how did you land it? That's a great question. Um, When I think about it, I would say the launch point for me was my second job. And that was as a public relations assistant at Villanova University. And the reason why I believe it was the launch of my career was it was a really high-profile job, and I had no idea it was going to be high-profile when I started. Um, that I joined the uh, the university, and uh, the next year they won the national basketball championship. Mm. So for a university, <laughs> that's pretty big. Uh-huh. <laughs> and and um, I when I took the job, I, I knew it was a stretch for me, and I you know it involved writing, which I felt very comfortable with. It also involved handling the media, which I felt pretty good about. But when you know the university team wins the national basketball championship, you really have to know how to handle the media. And it was a learning opportunity for me. Um, we had press calls from every organization you could think of around the world. I even answered the phone one day, and it was the White House calling to invite the team <laughs> to meet the president in the Rose Garden. So... It was really trial by fire, and it, it taught me a lot, and it was a really great opportunity for me. So when I think about what launched my career, that was, that was the job that really propelled me to think about, wow, I, I can really do something big here, and, and gave me the confidence to think that way. Mm-hmm. And so if it was a stretch job, and you weren't necessarily the quote-unquote obvious candidate, what do you think about you or how you approached it or how did you get the confidence to even go for that job? Like, how did you get there? Um, It's a great story. It's a really great story. So I submitted my application and this was in the day when you, you know, you mailed your resume and your cover letter, (laughs) which I did. I feel like it was back in the stone ages. And um, so I did that and I was working and uh, the call came in from the head of the department who was a very seasoned and experienced gentleman. And uh, my mom happened to be home that day, and she answered the phone. And he started grilling my mother. And he <laughs> said, you know, I think we'd like to have her come in, but, you know, I'm not really sure about her experience. She's pretty junior, and, you know, I really don't know. It, it, it would be a big stretch for her. And my mother said, trust me, just let her come in for the interview. Just trust me on this one. Just let her come in. And that's how I got the interview, because of my mother and her persuasiveness with uh, the head of the department. And I went in, and we had a great conversation. And honestly, I don't think I knew enough to know how big the job was. And maybe if I did, I would would have been nervous and Mm -hmm. and apprehensive. I just didn't know how big the job was. And I think the fact that the team won the National Basketball Championship didn't even – I didn't even think about the possibility of that. Mm -hmm. So – I didn't know enough to be nervous, and mm-hmm. she really, she got the interview for me. <laughs> I love that. Your very I, first PR person, your mom. I love it. My that's mom. Uh, yeah, that's true. She was my PR person, and yeah. she did a great job with yeah, well, it. Yeah, so. well, and she also knew the product, because obviously you did a great job, right? So so she had uh, exactly. kudos, kudos to moms. I love it. Yeah, yeah. 
So okay, he's so, responsible for my career. Exactly. There you go. Well, and and so much else that 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 uh, no doubt has gone right in your life. Um, That's true. So you go from Villanova, and then walk us through a little bit um, how you went through. I happen to know that you're that you're married. So talk to me a little bit, and, and let us know what was kind of your career progression, and how did you went you know when you got married, and you then had to start making trade offs. I know you don't you cho- you know you don't have kids, but they're still right. just with a the marriage. There's a lot of trade offs and compromises. How did you yep. manage all of that, and how did you kind of go from strength to strength to get to where you are? Yeah, so um, I left Villanova and went to the University of Delaware to be an editorial coordinator, and that was more on the graphic publication side. And I took that job because I really wanted to get more experience on that side. And it was another stretch opportunity. I really shouldn't have had that job, um, but they had confidence in me. And then I moved from there to Children's Hospital, and that opened a whole new world for me in, in healthcare, which was great and enabled me to go to to work at Merck, the pharmaceutical company, because mm-hmm. I had that healthcare experience. So it was really a, a great opportunity for me. When I took the job at Merck, uh, my husband and I were living in Baltimore, Maryland, and the Merck job was in New Jersey. And I knew it was such a good opportunity for me. Um, it would be the first time I worked in corporate America, mm-hmm. which is exactly what I was looking for. I'd worked, you know, in, um, in education settings in healthcare settings, but this was the first job in corporate America. And my husband and I talked about it a lot, and I decided to go for the job and got the job, but what it meant was we would have to start living apart. And so Mm. we had a lot of conversations around that. My husband has a business in Baltimore that he couldn't pick up and and move to New Jersey because he was well-established. So we made the decision that we would give it a try, and we have been living apart uh, during the week for 15 years. And wow. there are uh, there are a lot of pluses and minuses to this, mostly pluses in that I can work as much as I want. There's no one waiting for me at home and no one that I go home to, which is good, so I can really focus on my career. Also, going home on the weekends and spending time with him, we're very focused on the time we spend together on weekends. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing errands. I'm not picking up the dry cleaning. I'm not going to the grocery store. It's all about us on the weekends, which is really good. And I think some couples don't get that or don't realize how important that together time is and really focusing on each other, not just being together, but really focusing on each other. And I'd say the last point is um, he has been incredibly supportive of my career, always encouraging me always giving me even more confidence than I have in myself, just making me believe that basically I can do whatever I set out to do. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a great combination of having a supportive spouse, one who really lets me grow and, and be, and then having that relationship that is so strong that we can survive not living together full time. Mm-hmm. Well, and I will say, I um, and of course, I, I know Jerome, and, and, and he is awesome, yep. no doubt about it. Shout out to you, Jerome. <laughs> uh, good, good pick by Joan, and, and, and you're, you're the best. But I also um, have to say that almost every woman I've interviewed so far has said that one way or the other, probably the most important career decision you ever make is actually who you pick as your partner. Um, because whether you have kids or not, whether you have dogs or not, whatever it is, uh, that person either has to be truly ready to join you in a journey and support in some way your journey or not. Yep. And, and, yeah. if, and if they do, then you, you have the chance to fly. And if they don't, um, then it really is one of the major reasons that either people choose to get divorced if the woman really does want to keep going or um, it's why women keep turning things down because they know that their their spouse and their family can't go there. Um, and- right. Yeah, I agree with that 100%, Perry, in that when I took the job at Merck, which would mean that I had to you know, live apart from my husband, I also had an opportunity in Baltimore. And the opportunity in Baltimore was nowhere close to the opportunity at Merck. And, um, you know, we made the choice together. And, you know, he, he said from the very beginning – do what feels right for you, you know, and, and don't think about, you know, us being apart. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. 
And that just opened up the, the world to me. And I thought, wow, I, I can basically go anywhere I want. As long as I get back on weekends, it, it's good. So yeah, yeah. I, I think having a supportive spouse is absolutely key. Um, I could not have the career I've had without his support. I feel the same way. You know, my husband actually stayed home and, and, and took care of our of our little one. And uh, I would never have been able to do what I did uh, if he hadn't yeah. been willing to, to do that. So, um, yeah. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is on the way up, you know, fair or not, and of course I would say it's definitely not fair, um, women have always been more heavily scrutinized than men. And, and not just on things where I think it's, you know, fair game in terms of like, you know, performance and whatever, but on everything from, you know, kind of looks and vocal tone and style and, you know, everything. Yep. So did you also face that kind of intense scrutiny in, in the settings that you were in? And if you did, since I think every woman ultimately has to find her own way to handle it, what was your way? How did you manage it? You know, I have to be honest. I, I never felt like I was scrutinized because more because I was a woman. Hmm. I think for me, you know, I'm very tall, I'm 5'11". So, you know, when I walk into a room, it's, pretty sometimes imposing because <laughs> chances are I'm probably taller than some, most of the men in the room or at least equal to them. So and that's before the heels. It, before the heels, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, at, at first impressions, people look at me like, wow, you know, she's, she's really tall. I also think, though, you know, in, in my current company, my CEO has given me great advice and he is, I couldn't ask for a more supportive CEO. And he has told me, and I've been here for 10 years, and he, he's told me that, you know, don't forget that the, the cake doesn't always have to be fully baked. And I think sometimes as women, we, we walk into meetings or events and just think we have to be so buttoned up. You know, I have to be perfect. You know, I, I have to know every answer. I have to be prepared for any question that they're going to throw at me. And when you get to a point in your career when you realize, hmm, I really don't have to have all the answers. I have to be prepared for a good discussion or a debate and put my you know, ideas and opinions out there. That's when I think women shine because I think too frequently we look around the room and, and just imagine that we have to have everything right. I don't think men operate... In, in the same way, mm -hmm. uh, at least the men that I've worked with, you know, they'll throw out their opinion about anything. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I look at them, I think, you have no experience or expertise in that particular field, but it, it hasn't stopped them. Yet women, I think, are more reluctant to put their ideas and opinions out there. And when I first came to TE Connectivity, the company that I currently work for, I'm sitting around a table with a bunch of guys who have been in their roles or been with the company 20, 25 years, I was really intimidated. And I thought, I, I can't contribute anything. And our CEO pulled me aside and said, I want you to speak up more. And I said, I don't, I don't have any expertise in this field. And he said, but you have opinions. Mm -hmm. And I want you to put your opinions out there. What a great so I, I feel less like I've been treated differently or, or scrutinized because I'm a woman. I actually feel... I, in the beginning of my career, put it on myself that I was too timid. I didn't speak up enough. And I, I just felt like I couldn't until I knew everything was absolutely right. And when you get to the point where you realize you don't have to be perfect all the time, it is so liberating. Mm. And I think you're a, you're a better employee. You're a better leader. You're a better manager because of that. You're willing to share and, and realize it's okay to say I really don't have the answer to that. Mm -hmm. and, and I just think it's incredibly liberating. You know, I'm so glad that you said that because I, I completely agree with you, but it's really interesting. I was just reading a piece by um, Sally Blount. She's the dean out at Kellogg School of Management. Um, and just this week, she was writing a piece about how sometimes the biggest hurdle in a career is yourself, right? If you're a woman. Absolutely. And, and that what yep. happens, uh, what she realized is, and maybe it's all of us who were, you know, of a certain age, shall we say, raised in the late 60s and 70s or the 60s and 70s. And we all thought we had to be perfect, right? We just yep. kind of thought it's like be a good girl and, and be perfect. Yep. And like the perfect was the goal. And 
Whereas guys, it was kind of like, nobody ever said they had to be, you know, it's like, hey, go try right. that, climb that tree. If you fall, who cares, right? I mean, it's just a right. whole different mindset. And, and so you're right. We get in our own way by thinking that um, it, it, just because we're not expert, just because we don't have every single skill that might be ideal for a certain situation, um, that we have nothing to offer. Whereas sometimes, right. as I learned in Russia, frankly, ignorance was one of the greatest gifts, ignorance, and then the questioning that that drives of the team who really thought yep. they had it nailed down. That actually turned out to be one of the greatest gifts that I brought. And, and not many people can get hired for ignorance, but it actually, <laughs> it actually worked in that instance. And, uh, it, so. it does work. I mean, a, a, a great example. So early in my tenure here at, at TE Connectivity, our CEO said, let's have lunch you know, in his office. And so, you know, the, the night before I'm preparing, you know, notes about different projects I've been working on. I had PowerPoint presentations that, that I had given in, in other um, areas of the company. And I went in with my notebook and I, <laughs> I went in and sat down and he looked at me and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I, you know, I'm ready to talk about any, you know, I'm ready to go in any direction you're, you want to go. And he looked at me and he started laughing. He said, I really just wanted to have lunch with you. That's it. I just wanted to have lunch with you. You know, I don't, I don't need a, you know, a PowerPoint presentation, but that's, that's the way I felt uh, that I had to be prepared for anything he wanted to talk about. And we ended up talking about current events and that was it. That was it. And so again, I think when you give yourself license, to not be so buttoned up, it's, it's a great feeling and mm -hmm. it's a great feeling. And I think some of that comes over time you know, being in a role. And some of it comes, I think, with maturity. Uh, as you get towards the, the middle and end of your career, you realize that you, know, you look around, nobody has all the answers. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes you a better leader. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Excellent. So let's talk about a time when maybe uh, you had slightly less confidence and calmness and, and even really confident and capable women, you know, when they're facing a major transition. So whether it was when you transitioned in terms of living apart or whether you transitioned in terms of changing employers. I know that, you know, obviously you said your husband is one of your greatest supporters, but when you go to make a major transition, how do you get yourself ready for that? And, and do you have like a, a checklist or something that helps you succeed when you walk into a new role? That's a great question. I think for me, the, the biggest transition I made was um, moving from uh, communications and PR into running a business. Mm -hmm. I, I currently am fortunate I run a $2 billion business uh, at my company. And uh, to be honest with you, before I took this role, I had no experience running a business. My entire career was in public relations and, and communications, and it's because our CEO had faith in me. And I like to say that he throws you into the deep end of the pool, but he's always standing on the side with a life preserver to make sure you're successful. That's like the perfect um, boss. That's like my perfect boss. Yep. <laughs> he's great. He's great. And just has given me opportunities that I never would have thought I was capable of taking. And what happened was he asked me to go out and talk to some of our distributors. So these are companies that buy our product and sell our products to small customers. Okay, we have about, we had about 1,200 of these distributors around the world. And he said, I want you to go out and talk to them and find out what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, how we can do things better and, and generate more, greater growth for the company. So I did. I, I picked about 10 of them, and I went, went out and talked to them, and their feedback was very consistent. I also talked to um, some of the leaders in our company. Their feedback was very consistent. I had a task force helping me, and we came back and said, you know, we really think this dis distribution business needs to be a separate standalone business in the company. And our top leadership agreed, and we all said, okay, yeah, yeah, we, you know, we have to create this business unit. And then the question was, who was going to run it, mm -hmm. right? And so he came in, to, our CEO came in to me one day, and he said, you should run this. And I started laughing. I said, I don't have any experience in, in distribution. You know, I don't know, you know how to do this. <laughs> and he said, that's, that's why I want you to run it. He said, because you're asking all the right questions. You know, you're challenging the status quo. Mm -hmm. I want you to do this. And 
I thought about it. I, you know, let me have the weekend to think about it. And I thought about it, and I thought, okay, what's the worst that can happen? And mm-hmm. that's that's a question I always ask myself when I'm thinking about transitions or new roles, new companies. What's the worst that can happen? I thought, okay, I really screw this up. I still have my communications and public relations experience that I can fall back on. Mm -hmm. And also at the time, he asked me to handle dual roles. So still being the senior vice president for communications at our company and taking on this new responsibility. So I thought, okay, I can always go back to just the one role. How Mm -hmm. bad, you know, Mm -hmm. how bad can it be? And um, I took the job. I came back on Monday and told him I would take the job. And it's been fantastic. I mean, it's been a fantastic role. Have I been scared? Yeah. You know, heck yeah, I've been Mm -hmm. scared. Um, it's a two billion dollar business, you know. It's twenty percent of our company. Uh, you know, I, I have an opportunity if I screwed it up to really damage the company and and damage our shareholders. So it's just the way I felt was don't assume you know everything because I didn't, and mm-hmm. it's much harder to pretend you know everything. And by the way. Most of the time when you're pretending that you know everything, everybody else knows that you don't. So, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> to me, it's hysterical. Everybody knows that you don't know everything. How could I have known everything with a role that was newly created in an industry that I had no experience? I couldn't. Yep. But th- I think the key is getting the right people around you, getting the right team together, having that complementary set of skills among your team, and not being afraid to say, I'm not sure what the right path forward is. And not just with your team. It's with your colleagues, you know, on your executive team. Being able to say, you know, I'm thinking about this. How does this sound to you? Or I need some time just to to brainstorm with you. And it's it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful. I wouldn't turn back ever. And now, uh, you know, I'm running this business. I've actually turned over the communications and public relations responsibility to someone else in our company who's doing a fantastic job and things have been going really, really well. So it, it's because someone saw, uh, some, I don't know what it was he saw, but he saw something in me that he believed I could do this. And I, frankly, I was not going to let this man down. There was mm-hmm. no way I was going to let him down after he gave me this wonderful opportunity. Mm-hmm. You know, I knew we had a lot in common, but I, I didn't realize we had this as well. So for listeners who've listened to other of the podcasts, that is my absolute golden rule in exactly those words. What's the worst that could happen? When, when I moved <laughs> yeah. to Singapore with three weeks notice, having never been to the country and having no flipping idea what I was going to do out there. Yeah. And then I did Russia and then London and then Kraft and Unilever and, and then going out on my own twice and then opening a social enterprise. It was like every single time. <laughs> It's that, right. And people are like, how do you have the confidence to do it? And I view it exactly the way you do, which is if you know what the worst is and right. the, and you can live with it. Right. And the best yep. could be super cool. Then right. why would I ask myself the opposite question, I guess, of most women. And, and I'm just wishing more women would go this way, which is why not go for it then? Because if yeah. the downside can be minimized or you can live with it, there is no right. reason not to take pretty much every big, bold opportunity that's put out there for you. Now, clearly, right. if the downside is something you can't like, you are going to have, you know, you're going to be divorced or you will, you're, you know, your children will suffer truly not guilt by you, but like truly irreparable harm or, you know, physically you have a reason that you cannot take that on. OK, all of those are completely legitimate reasons to say no, because that worst case may not be something you can live with, right? That's not right. worth it. But most right. of us don't face those type of worst case scenarios. The worst case scenarios we normally face are, it's going to be hard. It's going to be scary. I might fail. I might get fired. I mean, and as long as you can see a path to say, well, if any of those things happen, I can pick myself back up and go on. I can still feed my family. I can still make a career. I can do it. Then it's like, That's- okay, go for it. Yeah. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, exact, exactly. And I, you know, I'm the kind of person that I like variety. Um, I Me too. don't like a job where I come in and every day is the same. I I, I love I make I I love lists. I make lists all the time, <laughs> and I always make I always make Another a list. Another thing we have in common: I'm the queen of lists. <laughs> I love lists, 
And before, you know, I leave at the end of the day, I make a list of things that I have to get done the following day. Mm -hmm. And what I love most about my job and basically all the jobs I've had is that usually around 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, I look at the list. I'm thinking, this is the wrong list. I have to do a new list of the things I have to do today because things are moving so fast and, and things are changing. The other thing I really enjoy, um, and this is part of my personality, I like to build or fix. Mm -hmm. I just don't like routine maintenance in, in a job. And so when he asked me if I would take on this you know, new business, it was a chance to build. And it was exactly what I was looking for. In term and he said to me, I feel like, you know, with your current job, it's becoming routine for, for me. And you know what? I hadn't even thought about that. He was the one that saw it and mm -hmm. said, you know, I think you're starting to get, you know, just to the point where I know you're not challenged. And it was absolutely right. So if you give me an opportunity to, you know, build or fix something with a lot of challenges where every day is different, I'm, I'm your girl. I mean, uh, that's what I, I look for. And like you said, it's always what's the worst that can happen? I mean, you don't do things, you know, crazy things, but what's the worst that can happen? You get another job, mm -hmm. okay? Or, you know, if you're doing two, you go back to one. That's totally always been my philosophy, yeah, philosophy I, too. I love it. I, I love it. And, yeah, I mean, I think there's, that's one of the things I love about being a consultant or in agency work or when I was in corporate, having such a broad span of control. So the number of disciplines and then 170 countries, right? There was – every single day was different. I have never yeah. had the same day twice. And yeah. I have never, as you said – never walked into the office and had a day go where every single thing I thought was going to happen happened and nothing else did. Right. And, yeah. and so for people who love that, then these are exactly the kind of careers that, that make, make sense for people who really want routine. I think that's tougher, but I, I, because the growth comes when you're building or fixing, right. The growth doesn't come from repetition uh, beyond a right. certain point. So excellent advice, Joan. I love that. I, I, one of the other things sure. I'm just going to say, one of the things I also love about this whole podcast series is even women I know and love already, I learn new things about them. So thank you. Um, no, no problem. So no now problem. let's talk about you're at the executive level. You're running a $2 billion business. You've got 700 plus people working for you. We yeah. often hear it's lonely at the top and even more so for women because they're frankly just fewer of us. In right. addition to your spouse, what is your support system? You know, you've talked about, obviously, your CEO is incredibly supportive, whether you call him a sponsor or a mentor or both. But what is the rest of your support system and how did you create it and how have you been able to maintain it given your busy life and your commuting marriage? <laughs> yeah, um, I would say girlfriends, girlfriends, girlfriends. Mm -hmm. um, I have three very, very close girlfriends who I know would walk through fire for me, and I would do the same for them. Mm -hmm. um, all three are professional women. Uh, we're all in different uh, industries, um, all of the com really diverse background. One's the CEO of a hospital system, the other one's a lobbyist, uh, and the other one is the president of a statewide association. So very different um, career paths. But these are women that I'm so comfortable with. I can let my guard down and tell them everything. One is a friend from first grade. Um, <laughs> and so this woman knows everything about me and I know everything about her. So there's no need for, you know, pretenses or trying to impress. And that's something I think too. Um, I see this frequently with women that there's a competition mm -hmm. uh, among, among women and I think we've got to remember that we all need to be there supporting each other, not competing against each other. And, yeah, you have to compete for jobs and, and things like that. But when you're in your role, you know, just, I think, just support the women that you work with. I don't see that as much with men in terms of that competitive, you know, they just go in and do their job and assume they're going to get, you know, promoted to the next level. But I see it, I see it frequently with women. And I just think you need to build this network. And my network really is my girlfriend. And we probably get together, Perry, uh, at least once a month. And it is hard. And sometimes, you know, as you know, because um, we've tried to schedule things together, um, <laughs> it is, you do have to schedule months out. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there are some days, you know, when 
it, we can actually send an email and say, hey, anyone around tonight, and it works. I went through a, a really rough time at one of my, my jobs, really rough, and to the point where I thought I was going to get fired. It was that bad. Mm. And I sent, I'll never forget this, I sent an email one day, and I said, it's bad, and, you know, I need you guys. They were at my house before I got home that night. And, wow. the, you know, w one came from, like, I think she was like 40 miles away because she had some dinner to go to that night. The other one was a little bit closer, um, but they, they showed up that night. And I thought, wow, that's, that's the kind of network you need. Like knowing that you have people in your network, whether it's men, women, old, young, whatever it is, you need people that you know if you pick up the phone, you send a text, you know, you send an email, they're going to be there for you. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how it works for me. And you know, I I joke that, you know, they're my babysitters during the week, and then they send me down to Baltimore on the weekend uh, to be with my <laughs> husband. Um, but, and I've even, I've even kept uh, my apartment where I live during the week. I have a 52-mile commute each way to work, but I've kept that apartment uh, where it is because I'm close to them. That's how important it is. So, so, so let me make sure I understand this. So not only do you live okay. far apart from your husband, so you're doing the Pennsylvania Baltimore commute for your husband, but every yep. morning you're driving 52 miles to get to your job yep. in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I, from New Jersey to Pennsylvania. Um, and I just keep saying, I keep going in this radius. I never get out of <laughs> Pennsylvania, Maryland, <laughs> or New Jersey. I, you know, I have enough miles logged. I probably could have driven across country, you know, 20 times. But um, that's how important it is to me. I mean, that's my family so. and my friends are in New Jersey, and I, I know how much I need them. Yep. And so that's why I haven't moved. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And that, that definitely speaks to the testament of you've got your support system and you make it work for you. So very yep. good. Um, yep. Let's move on to the, I, I kind of call this the fun round. And so it's not as directly related to career advice, but it is, you know, just, I think some interesting insights into, into who you are and, and your journey. So if you had one word you would use to describe your professional path so far and why, what would it be? Oh, it's a tough one. I would say unplanned. Uh, a lot of people say to me, well, you know, how did you plan your career? And I just laugh. And the answer is I didn't. I, I just, you know, I, I took that philosophy of find things that interest you, take a chance, also with the, you know, what's the worst that can happen, and, and see how it goes. You know, I, I never woke up saying, I want to run a $2 billion distribution business. Mm -hmm. I never did that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, actually, I started my career. I went to school, to college uh, as a physical therapy major. And, you know, two years into it, I thought, I really don't like this. And I had taken a communications class as an elective. And I thought, wow, this, this really makes sense to me. I, I get it. And I really like it. So um, one of the most challenging uh, phone calls I've ever had was I called home, and my dad answered, and I said, Dad, I'm going to change majors. And he really wanted me to be a physical therapist. He thought they were amazing, which they are. Um, and he said, okay, what are you going to do? And I said, I want to be a communications major. Dead silence. <laughs> Dead silence. <laughs> I and got exactly said, the same reaction. <laughs> and then he said to me, you would make more money as a toll collector on the New Jersey Turnpike than in communication. Well, I was, I, what do you say? What do you say? And that is something we have joked about for years because I am fortunate. I have been very successful in my career and I actually do make more uh, money than a toll collector on the New Jersey Turnpike. Just a bit. And we just, we just joke about it all the time. And, but that was his reaction. But I knew that that was something I wanted to pursue. After that, all bets were off in mm -hmm. terms of I just looked for opportunities that I thought were interesting and that I could learn from, and I, I just went after those. So I, I would say unplanned. That is so funny. 
You know, I wonder how many people listening to this have had that dad moment because uh, my father and I fought all the time about my, I, I was an English lit major, right? And he used to say, okay, if you're not going to marry a rich man, how are you going to support yourself? Because I'm not going to support you <laughs> once you graduate, right? You have to. And I said, dad, I will, you know, do whatever it takes to support myself. I promise you. I said, what I, I'm learning how to think, I'm learning how to write, I'm learning how to express myself. I'm like, I will figure it out. I promise you, I will not be on your dime. Sure. And, and indeed, I have turned out to be, you know, very successful and made a lot of money. And so now he says, oh, honey, just thank God you never listened to me, right? <laughs> it's just like, and because I, I couldn't, he wanted me to study computer science because that was the big thing, right? And I was just like, yeah. Dad, it's just not me. I'm not a number right. person. I'm a word person. So it just, it didn't work. So I think you're right. You've got to, I mean, if you had told me at 12, I was going to work in 50 countries and, you know, um, yeah. ma- you know make a lot of money, I would have been like, I'm not thinking that's what I'm going to be doing, but yep. Exactly. 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 All righty. So next fun question. If you could have a superpower roundtable with three to five women alive or not, who would they be and why? Harry, you're really challenging me here this morning. (laughs) Um, I I would say Jackie Kennedy. Mm. Uh, I'm reading, reading a book about her right now. Um, Adele the singer Mm -hmm. and my mom, my mom. And the reasons why was you said at the beginning, my mom was my biggest PR person um, and and had an incredible work ethic. My mom was the secretary and she, I mean, drives through snow, rain. If she wasn't feeling well, she went to work and she taught me the importance of working hard and persevering and just wanting to do the best that you can. She also taught me the importance of being kind and respectful of the people that you worked with and for. Um, so I'd say my mom, Adele, I just think she's, you know, she's successful. She's down to earth. She's funny. I just think she would be a great person to have mm-hmm. lunch and dinner with. Yeah. And, um, and Jackie Kennedy, I, I would pick her because she was a very private person uh, who was thrust into the spotlight. Um, so she dealt with a lot of uncomfortableness, which is something I've experienced in my career, and uh, also just because of the image that she created of her family, of the White House, and really helped the country, I think, know that there was hope and change. Mm. So th- those would be my three women. Uh, well, that that sounds like a really cool event, and if you were ever able to get that you together, come? you know exactly. I totally want an invitation. I want an invitation. I'll even. I don't care. I'll serve the drinks. I'll whatever. I'm good. I just I just want to be in the room. Um, That's the deal. That's awesome. the deal. Okay. So, is there anything I haven't asked you that you would have wanted me to ask you? Um, I think, Perry, uh, how I would define success. Oh, I like and- that. Yep. Yeah, I'm asked this question a lot. You know, how do you define success? And sometimes people say to me, oh, you don't have children. Um, I don't. And I think everybody's different in how they define success. I think some women who, you know, are moms would define it as, you know, I want to see my, my children be successful, go to college, you know, find a nice partner, things like that. And I think for me, success, it's not about the money. It's not about the title. I think it's it's having a job that I like, you know, the variety, the the building, the fixing, the creating, um, and working with people who I like and have my back. You give me that in my career, I'm good. I'm really good. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I just think, I mentioned this before, when you get to that place in your career where you're comfortable with who, who you are, and you don't feel like you have to prove yourself all the time, it's a wonderful thing. It's a really wonderful thing. And I'm incredibly happy with where I am in my career. Um, I never knew it would be this good. I never knew it could be this good. And so I I think that's how I define success. I think that's, I think that's awesome. And I hope that for every person, there's a couple things you said there that I'll just pick up on for listeners. And, and, and one is I, I often tell people, don't just chase the money because at some point the money or the title or whatever, and believe me, this is coming from somebody who chased both of those things at different points, right? It, it, 
once you get it, you'll recognize that actually it's not enough, right? It's not what would get me up. And if it did was the thing that got me up for a while, it got me up for the wrong reason. Um, And so I became a much better professional when I stopped chasing just the money or the title, when it became less about me and more about the organization and the team and the environment. And, and then I think the other thing you said that I think is completely, and it doesn't matter whether you have kids. I mean, I happen to have kids and, and, and they are the absolute greatest joy of my life, but on a day-to-day basis, if you're successful as a parent, they go off and do their own thing, right? So for right. me, right. It, 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 that's my definition of success, right? Is that you actually raise them to be independent you know, individuals and they sure. go forth and prosper. But mm-hmm. I think what's really amazing about a career is that you, I just want something where I feel like I can using the gifts that I've been given to the best mm-hmm. of my ability and make a difference every day. And if that happens, like it gives me it gives me so much adrenaline and excitement to be making a difference. And so, right. so it's like, okay, there you go. And so I think that that's, it's really important. And I think it really is important that everybody come up with what's their definition, but realize that it needs to come ultimately somewhere from meaning or from deeper than the surface. Um, or right. you're probably not going to have the guts to stick with it during the tough times because there will also be tough times as there always are. Absolutely. And, you know, I wouldn't do the two hour drive on Monday mornings and the two hour to to get to my job from, you know, home, home, home. I wouldn't do the two hour drive on Thursday nights to get get home and spend, you know, the week away from my husband. You know, it has to be a job that gives you happiness. Yep. And that's what I have. I, I couldn't agree more. So we are down to the last question, and you have a choice on this one, or you could answer both. It's okay. okay. Uh, I know time always flies. Uh, so yeah. if you could do it all again, what advice would you give your younger self? Or what's the best piece of career advice you ever received? I think it's, I think it's the same for both, Perry. It's that relax. You don't have to be perfect. And, you know, my CEO told me that. And I would give that advice to my younger self. If I knew that at the beginning or middle of my career, I think I could have been a rock star. Um, but it was when I just relaxed and I was myself. I wasn't trying to prove anything. Um, I just, I didn't have to be perfect. It is, as I said before, it is so liberating. Um, you, you really, I think you are much better at your job when you get to that point. I think you're absolutely right, but I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you to think through this with me, which is how could you do that differently? So I'm imagining I'm sitting in a, yeah. I'm 32 years old and I'm sitting in a job interview and you're telling yeah. me, I don't have to be perfect. Be you. How does yeah. that manifest itself? Like, is it really possible at 32 in the middle of your career before you got to, you have all of these yeah. wins under your belt? How, how, how do you think we can... Yeah really help women who are much younger than, than we are get there earlier? I think, Perry, it's, it, a lot of it uh, involves speaking up and not being quiet in a room. Um, and you're great at this, and I, I don't know if you were this at 32, but it's you know putting your ideas and your opinions out there versus waiting to be asked or thinking that, oh, you know, I'm not as good as the person to my left or the person to the right. You're there for a reason. You know, that's your job. And people expect you to and want you to speak up and offer your ideas and, and opinions. That's why you're in the job, mm-hmm. right? It's not to sit there and observe what's going on. And, you know, I'm in the communications and, and public relations field, at least I was. And, for example, I always felt that I could start chiming in after the decisions were made, after the strategy was made, after the program was developed. And then I would go out and, and promote it or, you know, make people aware of it or whatever. But I never felt like I could chime in during the discussion about what it was or what it was going to be in terms of a product or a program. I missed so many opportunities to help shape things, help define, you know, programs. And I wish I knew then what I know now because I would have spoken up a lot more and offered my opinion and my thoughts. Excellent. Joan, that is an awesome piece of advice and a great place to end. Thank you so much for your time. I know that listeners are going to get a lot out of this. Thanks, Perry. And it was good to spend time with you. Thank you so much for including me. You've been listening to Pivot Points, a series designed to help ambitious women have the careers and lives of their dreams. To hear more interviews, go to 
www.yourcareeryourterms.com. And be sure to tell us what you think. If there are topics you'd like...